Sales Nation, welcome to this top 2020 episode of the Salesman Podcast. As voted on by you guys, Sales Nation, over a thousand of you have voted, so I appreciate the votes. And this episode with Tim Reistro was right up there at the top of things. And we're covering in this particular episode how you can upsell your current customers, how you can drive more revenue from them, and so you don't have to go do new prospecting in, a, in an uncertain marketplace. This episode to wrap up 2020 is the one for you. Everything that we talk about is available in the show notes over at salesman.org, as always. And with that said, let's jump right into it. How much revenue are salespeople potentially leaving on the table by focusing on what seemingly seems like for a lot of salespeople, the obvious thing to do, focusing on winning prospects and new business, as opposed to upselling or reselling their current customers? Well, I don't know how much revenue they're leaving on the table, but really when you look at any company's quota or revenue target in any individual seller, 70 to 80% of that number is existing customers. And that is either renewing or expanding, selling extras, upgrading, updating, whatever it might be. I was standing in front of a large sales kickoff recently for a very well-known software company that does CRM. And they they identified that 80% of your number this year is reliant on what you do with existing customers. And so you better do it well. So the question becomes, what's your renewal rate? Could it be better? What's your attachment rate, penetration rate, add-on rate? Could it be better? Um, And how much of your revenue or target is riding on that? And how prevalent is all of this right now as we record this on, what's the date just so we have context, the 31st of March, 2020? We're going into this uh, you know, pandemic, we're in the midst potentially of this pandemic, the economy has took a dive. How important is focusing on and potentially upselling or reselling or reaffirming your, your product and your service with your current customers in this climate versus just the general 12, 15 years of good times we've had before this? Yeah, I think that uh, ironically, just like sellers are now having to sell remotely 100% of the time instead of, oh, I don't know, 50% of the time, I feel like existing customer work has now become your entire work. Uh, If you think about it, nobody's making big decisions, rash decisions to change vendors right now. If anything, they're making decisions to start shedding some things. So being able to take care of your current customers, keep them and and Maybe your only next upside opportunity is going to be them doing something more with you. Because fundamentally, your customers, as long as things are going pretty well, they know you, they trust you. And right now, that's what people need is something they can know and something they can trust if they're going to do anything additional. So I believe it's now become 100% of the job for a while. And uh, taking advantage of your incumbent advantage is now the motto. And what does this process look like then, Tim? Is is step one taking care of people, getting that know, like, and trust, building a, the, the rapport even deeper, and then looking at potential opportunities, not to necessarily upsell within this current climate, that might come down the line, but to to add more value so that it becomes a no-brainer to spend more money in the future. Is there a step-by-step process to implementing some of this? Yeah, I think so. The 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 idea of adding value, though, is it it did you add value? If it isn't documented or memorialized, did you add any value, right? If a tree (laughs) falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a noise? So I think the first thing you want to do is make sure you are documenting results. You're getting agreement on what kind of business impacts you're trying to have, what kind of outcomes you're trying to achieve, what kind of goals are trying to reach with your solution, and how good a job have you done at assuring that they're using it, they're using it well, and they're getting the promised results, and then documenting that and making sure that you're sharing that on a regular cadence. So ensuring adoption utilization and um, and identifying and, and documenting and then sharing business impacts on a regular cadence. That is clearly step one, two, three, because every single move you're gonna make, whether it's a renewal or an upsell of any type, starts with identifying and documenting results anchoring and justifying their faith in you. So let's make sure you have that foundation so that later when you have to have the renewal conversation and the upsell conversation, you can leverage that. 
And what does, and I don't mean to be um, a kind of a stickler here, but what, what would be an example of a, a business impact or doing a good job? Because we throw, I, I saw your face turn when I said uh, just add value because it, it doesn't mean anything, right? It's, it's a phrase that people throw around when they're not being definitive on things. So what would be an example of, a, a, especially in the climate that we're in, a business impact that your organization could have on another organization? Yeah, you have to think um, there's two concepts that we actually teach sellers. The first is the three R's um, and those R's stand for returns. And there are three forms of returns, hard R's, which are quantifiable. And those are the ones that you can attach to an income statement or a balance sheet. So cost out, uh, revenue up, real hard things that they would recognize on official financial documents. Soft R's. Those are the things that they recognize as truly impactful and meaningful to the organization, but not as quantifiable on typical financial statements. Um, let's say satisfaction, um, time to market, turnover. So things that are important to the business, but softer because they can't be counted by the bean counters. And then strategic R's. Those are the ones where you're looking for a competitive edge in the market and you get some differentiation. You, you make a move in a marketplace to respond to a uh, changing environment, like the ability to respond to a pandemic. So strategic R's are often uh, the ways you set yourself apart in the market and the ways you think you will gain advantage. Soft R's are those important things that are measurable but not counted on a financial statement, and then hard R's are those that are. The second thing that we teach people are what we call the triple metric. We do everything in threes, I guess. <laughs> so you have your, your project level objectives. What did you all agree you needed to do with this project? Then how does that connect to something that the business or department that this project's in needed to accomplish? And then how did that accomplishment uh, help the business overall? So triple metric, project, department, business, or company. And you, you're trying to create a food chain effect, but it all starts with meeting your project level objectives and then showing like a layer above what that means to things they care about and then making some dot connections above that. So not to paint all uh, managers, leaders, and end users of products with a, a broad brush here, but... I imagine a lot of them are feeling somewhat paralyzed. They're probably worried about their own jobs, uh, their, their own security on that front. Are there any of these, um, whether it's uh, hard, soft, or strategic, that have a, a bigger psychological impact on somebody who is perhaps sat there looking at spreadsheets and trying to justify their own job in middle management that we might be trying to sell to over the next kind of six months? Is there any of these that would have more impact to focus on now than perhaps uh, prior? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It, you know, what's interesting is I always argue that the hard R's, the really quantifiable measures, are are good for justification and validation, but they aren't really the thing that moves a decision. A decision's much more emotional. So there's a story that needs to be told. And I believe in the soft and strategic R's, that's where the story lives and the story that convinces people they should either stick with something or change lives in that world. And then they use the hard R's to convince themselves and everybody else they made a good choice. So the choice is already made often and the hard R's is just that validation that we all sort of cognitively need to feel better about ourselves and hopefully everybody else feels good about us. Um, but interestingly, the real change is, is emotional and intuitive and those live in the other R's. So with that said, then, if we were to focus on stories to anchor or, or pre-frame up a change in the future right now, is there, is there a type of story that works, a customer success story or a, a, you know, a product story? Is there a way of communicating with a potential customer, uh, with a current customer right now that we are the safe bet, you should invest further into us and we do have your back? Is there a way to communicate that again that's going to have more impact in, the, in this moment in time? Yeah. So one of the best ways to tell any kind of story is to make sure that you tell, we call it current state, future state, business change. And so I'm going to use my hands for those who are watching this on video. There's a current state and what they're doing today and the future state that you're promising and want to talk about. And they have to envision and try that on and take ownership of that. I always say they have to live in that contrast. And in that contrast between current state and future state is where they start to perceive value. 
And, and so the, the story you tell is, is helping them fully establish and agree on what they think the current state is and what the future state could be. And then start to look at that contrast in the middle and say, is that enough value for me to make a change? Is that worth the effort? People will rarely make a change to get more or less the same as what they've got. If, if, if everything looks the same, they're just going to stick with what they're doing and what they've got. And so if they're going to take on the risk of change or do something new or different, they're going to have to see enough contrast in terms of what they do different and do better and what will happen differently and happen better. So we call it the current state, future state, business change story or the story with contrast. Because again, that part of the brain that makes the decision actually needs contrast to, to cause it to uh, make that choice. So are we better focused, and I don't know the answer to this question, I genuinely uh, look forward to your, your response here, but the future state that we are perhaps, um, I don't want to use the word pitch, but I'm going to say it because I, don't, I can't think of a better way to describe it, but the future state that we are pitching our current customers, should we be pitching them that everything's going to go back to normal and you're going to do this and everything's going to be great, or should we be pitching them that things are going to have changed, you're going to have to change with it, because that seems like it could instill even more anxiety and get them to batten down the hatches even more so and, and double down on the status quo, even though that might be more accurate. Yeah, so that's uh, that's really putting a good sort of stress test on some of our models. So in all honesty, when you tell any kind of change story to your existing customer, you should open with saying, Here's what we've accomplished together. Here's some of the good things that have happened. And here's the investment and effort that we've both made in each other. There's a piece of science called sunk cost. And, and people believe that uh, if there's any kind of positive momentum and they've put a lot of investment and effort in getting that, that they're now on a trajectory. If they change, they have to start all that over. So the idea with an existing customer is not to have sort of an abrupt, brutal change conversation. It's to make it look evolutionary. That's why we call it the expansion sale. It's not disruption. It's not uh, this idea of coming in and, and provoking uh, the, the phrases challenging. It's none mm -hmm. of that. That will backfire with an existing customer and even more in these times. Now it's a matter of here's what we've done together. Here's all the time and effort you've made to change your processes, to onboard your people, to maybe change your nomenclature, to put the systems in place, create the interfaces. Now, we're now sort of operating in a, in a frictionless environment. It's just part of your operating rhythm. Let's talk about a couple evolving trends that are happening subsequent to that. You made a great decision here, but here are some of the changes being made, and here's some of the ways we're prepared to help you address them. So in an existing customer relationship, any sort of change or next is built on the platform of success and investment and effort sunk so that now they feel like they're maybe a little bit more free to do a couple of these things because it's incremental and evolutionary and an opportunity to continue to get better, not some sort of abrupt disruption, a reconsideration or rethink of everything they're doing. That's the kind of approach you take when you're trying to dislodge an incumbent, not when you are the incumbent. So should we be, I know the answer to this because I've read the book and it, you're talking about it in the book, but I'll tell you it up for the audience. Should we be doing this a process of doubling down on everything that we've achieved to strengthen the status quo in customers who are, perhaps they're a subscription, uh, you know, a SaaS, we're selling a SaaS product, whatever it is. Should we be now calling on these people and really emphasizing how hard it was to get the deal done in the first place and everything that we've done so far and how much of a pain in the arse it would be to change suppliers or leave us now? Is this something that we should proactively be doing right now, this moment? I believe so. In fact, I don't think just because of a pandemic. In existing customer relationships, there's a motion, an approach that is 180 degrees different from the acquisition. We often say that you defeat status quo bias when you are not the status quo bias. You want to reinforce the status quo bias when you are the status quo bias. And you want to have regular business reviews where you go in and check in and they do exactly that. You remind them of the diligence they put into the process to make this decision because subconsciously you want them thinking, do I want to go through that again? You want to remind them of the business impact so that people go, you know, why would I want to stop a moving train? You tell them of the investment and effort made and they go, why would I want to find more budget and do that again? And then you talk about the new opportunities and the upside and the changes and the and 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 the advances that are being made. 
And, and, and I see that as like an agenda almost that you can bring to them twice a year or quarterly, whatever you see is important to have a certain cadence that allows you to put some new stuff in front of them, but always in the context of continuing the progress. So I would suggest that you create a regular rhythm if you don't already with existing customers of having business reviews. And then what we've produced in the book are two frameworks, the framework for a renewal related business review or one for an upsell related business review. But they all are foundationally rooted in this idea of the investment, the effort and the impact so far and then building that story on the top of it. So let, let's get practical, Tim. How do we, uh, and I like this, the term business review, uh, because it removes the, the sales element from the conversation uh, in, the, in the, the framing of, the, of, the, uh, of, of what we're sitting down here to, to discuss. Um, how, how do we pitch a business review to someone who is panicking about the job? They are, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. There's people being laid off in the organization. They are wanting to look good in front of their boss so that they then are less likely to lose their job. Even, you know, this is just a perception of all this happening rather than it happening in reality. How do we go about practically phoning, emailing, setting up a business review in the next week or so for someone who's listening to this episode who wants to put this into practice? If, if we could just for a moment assume that the person you're speaking with, that person who might be a little bit panicked on the inside of their company, but is in charge of the project that your yep. product or service is attached to, now more than ever, they could probably look, they could probably use or would really appreciate some sort of well-documented, sound business impact and outcomes to justify the effort and investment that they've made. So... This opportunity, a business review is really, hey, we're going to help everybody involved understand how sound their judgment was in the decision and and how uh, we've progressed since then. And everyone can start to see this is vital to the business. If it's not documented and not memorialized, it might as well not have happened. And so I think in exchange, right, you're exchanging value here in exchange for giving you the time to have one of these meetings, you're going to be bringing the kind of evidence that is useful to them personally and professionally in that organization and the project or job that they're working on. Ideally, that's that's why they bought you in the first place. So uh, it would really be in their best interest and in our good partnership to help them put that p- case together. So we are coming to them with some kind of, or we're hoping to end the meeting with some kind of document that looks at the returns, hard, soft, and strategic, so that they can perhaps show that to their boss and say, hey, you you pay me, I invest the, the capital that you give me, and we've got these results. Look how wonderful and important and necessary I am in the organization. Is that what we're trying to achieve here? Absolutely. Now, ideally, when you sold the business, you would have convinced them these are the R's you're going to hit. So that now when you're reviewing the business, you're measuring those R's. Um, but, in, in, you know, I'm, I'm going to accept that not everybody went in with a business case. Um, but if you did, if you had any kind of business case, now's the time to go and try and figure out what marks you've hit. And here's what I can promise you. You don't have to have hit them 100 percent. Even if you show progress, like 25, 30, 40 percent toward goal, Most people are like, that's great, because if we keep working, we'll get there. So you want to show positive momentum and trajectory. Don't panic if it isn't 100 percent of goal, uh, because the the risk is if they change now, they could do even worse than what they're doing. So just lean into that a little bit. If you never documented anything in the deal, you didn't have any kind of business case requirement. Now is the time to put a little dashboard together and start to identify some metrics that are measurable cooperatively and things you can report back on to the organization. That is a great exercise before asking for a business review. Hey, let's have a working session to determine the impact. Even just having the, the um, what do you, uh, just the forthrightness to say, I want to engage in a discussion to make sure you're getting the adoption, utilization, and impact, and then we can report on it later to do a little work around that. That's, that should have, It should be a part of our cadence. I recognize it's not always. Now's a good time to put that in place. I feel like by just doing this, even if we are doing it retrospectively, even if no one has, uh, if if some of the audience hadn't come across the book, uh, your training at at Corporate Visions and and everything else, that we, uh, you're you're instantly differentiating yourself from all the pesky salespeople who are just 
ring you up for a new business right now. And you're, 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 it's almost like a personal branding exercise in sorts of you're becoming seen in the eyes of the buyer as a, not even a sales, but as, as a business person, as a, as a, I know it's cliche to say cons- sales consultants or, or people along those lines, but you, you're separating yourself into that category, right? Rather than the used car salesperson who got into B2B sales <laughs> and who's just flogging and pitching it as heavy and as harsh as they can. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, I think everybody's said, to your point, it's a little cliche, we got to be more consultative. Uh, we got to be a trusted advisor. And they maybe sprinkled in a few extra probing questions to sound consultative. <laughs> yeah. And they said, check, I'm a trusted advisor. I, I always joke that if you ask the customer questions about what their pains are, and then you replay those for the customer, that doesn't make you a trusted advisor, that makes you a tape recorder. So the real opportunity here is, to actually live out this value or this concept and not do it in some forced contrived way, just having this dialogue immediately positions you that way. And they start to think, why would I bring in a salesperson with a new thing when I've got a partner with the existing thing? So if you just lean into this behavior um, and this activity together, yes, I think those things will accrue to you. Those things that you just hoped for <laughs> just it now will happen because you're actually functioning like that that makes total sense okay so we've covered with why we should be spending time with our current customers especially at this moment in time during this this pandemic crisis we've covered perhaps how you can dislodge the status quo slightly so then you can potentially upsell to a, a better a higher level of service and you can frame that as the fact that you are now a partner and you've got this, they've got this background together and you can move forward and, and do bigger and better things. We've also covered how you can keep someone on board by doubling down on the status quo and making them so terrified to to move and as long as they're getting the results that they expected, to, so terrified to go to someone else or to re uh, reinvestigate this that it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be cost effective or time effective for them. I guess the final thing to look at here, Tim, is. What do we do if things aren't going to plan? Perhaps we've made a mistake. Perhaps they are, everyone's working from home and they're not using our product and they've not got that um, login rate from our SaaS software that we were hoping and expecting. How can we communicate with our current customers during what might be, for some people, relatively tough times and keep them on board rather than, you know, rather than double down on selling them more or keeping them as a, as a customer because everything's going fine. What do we do in a situation where things perhaps aren't going so well for us in the account? Yeah. In the book, we, we uh, talk about this because in renewals, we talk about, you have to answer the why stay question. Why should they stay with you? In upsells, you have to answer the why evolve question. Why do more with this company? Well, there's also the moment where that your customer's asking, why should I forgive them? Why should I, <laughs> why should I uh, continue to do more despite this situation or circumstance? And this happened, I was at a conference and I was speaking about why stay and why evolve, those two movements we just talked about. And a group of people came up to me afterward and said, okay, we're from a telecom, a B2B telecom. And what if your customers aren't really happy with you right now? Do these <laughs> methods work? And, and I joked, they didn't think it was funny. I said, well, don't worry. You're a telecom. Nobody likes their telecom mm. provider. And um, <laughs> so there was, ha ha. And then I said, okay, we got to get down to science. Well, there's a whole discipline out there called the apology sciences. Um, but most of it's done in like politician and celebrity world. How to, how to apologize after a moral failure. And, and they talk about different um, elements of a good apology. There's limited work in B2B, and we wanted to dig into that with some of our research. So we took some of the findings and identified five components of a good apology, and we wanted to determine if they worked in B2B and if there was a specific order. Like, did you should you apologize and document your apology? Because like we said earlier, just saying it isn't enough. Like, the real important part of an apology is how you document and memorialize it, because that's what circulates or walks the halls mm-hmm. of your customer or gets viral uh, on the email chain inside your customer. So what do you say and how do you document it in such a way that you invoke um, uh, a piece of research called the service recovery paradox? And the reason it's a paradox is it says if you recover well from a service problem, you can engender more loyalty than if you never had a problem in the first place. So there's the old axiom, never waste a good crisis. What I like to say is, hey, don't panic if you've got service problems. They're an opportunity if you handle it well. Now, I'm going to assume that you're taking responsibility and working to recover, 
But what the research shows is the documented apology is what has the greatest effect on the recovery, on the service recovery paradox, because later on, when they have to renew or buy more from you, it's the documented apology they remember. If you didn't document the apology and how you plan to fix it, the only thing they remember was the problem. Oh, yeah, that's the company we had that issue with. So what you want is this document memorialized sort of process. And uh, so what we did is the research on the key elements of an apology in the proper order to have the greatest impact. And in the book, we, we have this moment where we show you the different orders we tried and you think about which one do you think would work? Every time I'm in a room and I say, which of these five test conditions do you think was the winning model? <laughs> People pick the one that performed worst or second worst. Mm. The one that won was actually quite counterintuitive, and and that sort of blows people's minds. They're like, wow, I would have been doing this all wrong. And again, practically, what does that documentation look like? Is it, I'm assuming it isn't, I, Will Barron, apologize for watching Netflix when I should have been on the phone with you last Tuesday, and this caused this and this and this and this and this. How, how do we document that? What, what does that look like? Is it on a page? Is it you know, could we do a video? Is it a voicemail? What does it practically look like? In the test. So when we do studies, we run simulations and we recruit would be B2B buyers and we put them in this scenario. And in this test, we told them this software went down during a critical period. Who was here's who was mad at you. Here's who was um, all uptight. And um, this is what puts your you know, this is how your career was jeopardized. And then we ask them to rate on a scale of one to ten. How mad would you be? And then one and two were the most mad. And we only took them and put them into the study. We wanted the people who were really mad. Uh, scientists call this, they had to be past the zone of indifference. Um, and so we put them into the study. And what we discovered is that the most important thing you can do first in an apology, and in the test, it was a document. It was, here's the email sent by the company with the apology. We didn't test a video versus an email because we were really looking for placement in the test, we cut and paste the same words, but in different orders. Sure. So that was yeah. our best way to do it. Turned out that people respond significantly more favorably when you open, not with, I will, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, in fact, when you open up with, I'm sorry, it performs worse. What you open up with is, here's the problem, here's the repair, and here's the value we plan to restore to you. It's, it's called justice theory, where they perceive there was a, a lack of fairness. The thing about a customer and seller relationship is there's always a balance of fairness. When there's a problem, they perceive there's a lack of fairness. They are not getting the value they paid for. So what you open with is this offer to repair and not, not just the fix, but to repair the value that was perceived lost. So what did you do in terms of providing extra resources at no cost? What are you going to do to maybe extend the contract for the time that was lost? What are you going to do? Offer to repair the perception of lost value because it turns out they're not ready to hear your apologies till they know fairness has been restored. A bunch of apologies at the beginning are like falling on deaf ears, at least according to our research and the way the numbers presented. Um, the, the close of your apology is all the nice soft stuff. It turns out like you want to exit well. The, when we put other things at the end, it just sounded like excuse making. Mm -hmm. So there, one component was um, identify the precise cause of the problem. You want to say that in their apology somewhere because they, you want them to know you know why it happened because then that increases their confidence that it won't happen in the future and that you can fix it. If you end with that statement, then it sounds like you're just pointing fingers and, and making excuses. So open with the offer to repair the value and close with the soft apology sort of that um, I'm sorry, repentance part in the middle is all kinds of like explanations of exactly what the problem was, how you fixed it, how you're never going to um, let that happen again, what you've done to mitigate it. But the opens and the close are so important, we discovered, and it does matter what went first and what went last. And tell me if I'm right here or, or wrong, but it seems like you're focusing on the value rather than the transactional costs that may have, uh, have, uh, have occurred or, or have been uh, negligated by, the, 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 for example, the software product going down. You're giving people an extra month of free access as opposed to saying, we'll refund you for the month that you are lacking. Is that something that you looked at? Yeah, it's, um, you know, for us, the, the, whenever you're running a test like this, you, you, um, 
you you have to create some scenarios, simulations, and assumptions. And uh, so the premise here was that that you had to um, you had mitigated the problem. Like it was when you document the result. Uh, here's what I'm saying: is if someone calls you and their hair's on fire, you don't say. Uh, here's my offer to repair. You say, I'm very sorry, your hair's on Got fire okay. and we'll get right to it. And that everything else you're doing in terms of documenting the result is memorializing and documenting what took place because this is the key. This is the thing that will, um, uh, like I said, walk the halls afterward and for uh, in per, you know, perpetuity. The idea is that when when everything's calmed down and now they have to think about your relationship, they've got this to fall back on. And what we discovered is the right apology then can impact both their willingness to buy again and their willingness to buy more. We discovered the right apology can significantly improve their willingness to be a reference and um, actually advocate for you. It's crazy that, uh, you, that, that you can increase the level mm -hmm. of advocacy and buying more if you apologized well as opposed to never having had a problem in the first place. And the right apology can increase their confidence level in your business and your reputation and brand. So doing this well has many uh, impacts and across time, like at the moment of renewal and upsell, that this is a referenceable document. So we'll, we'll wrap up with this, Tim. So this is coming from someone, I am a published chemist. I've got a um, a study that was published in the Journal of Computational Chemistry back in university. I've got my degrees in uh, chemistry. I've got another science podcast that I do on the side as a hobby. So when you talk about studies and data, um, I'm lit up for like ear to ear. I, I love all this stuff. How much, and this is an opportunity for you to promote yourself as well, I guess, um, uh, you know, as, as subtly or as abruptly as, you, as you'd like to, but out of what percentage of all the training in, in the, the sales training industry and all the um, cliches that we all you know, have at the back of our brains, whether they're right or wrong, how much of it is based on data and how much of it is based on some dude or woman in the 90s had a hunch and wrote a book on it? Yeah, um, <laughs> I believe that most of what you're hearing is individual success parlayed into a book which is really unexamined folklore. And the problem with the human brain is the way we explain things is different than the way they really happened. <laughs> and so this is, we explain things in the way we'd like to think they happened and we want you to, and how we want you to think of us. And it's the same way in human decision-making, right? We, our ability to explain a decision is, 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 is impossible because the decision takes place in a part of the brain that doesn't contain the capacity for language. So what I would say is, um, many people talk about in business analytics and a data rich world that we are information rich, but theory poor. We have so much data. We just don't know what to make sense of it or how to make sense of it in selling. I believe we are theory rich, but data poor. And you, if you poke underneath most of what's out there, it's one person's opinion or a couple observed best mm -hmm. practices, but they don't really know why those worked. We do studies in the areas of decision science and how humans frame value and humans make choices because ultimately the only science that matters is brain science. How does somebody process the invisible forces to make a decision? How do they frame value? How do they make choices? So we do our work in the decision-making sciences of cognitive neuroscience, social psychology, behavioral economics, and then we make it really simple. We say, here's the message that works best when you're trying to dislodge an incumbent and win new business. Here's a message that works best when you're trying to protect your incumbency because you are the incumbent and how to build on that. And it's because we've studied and seen the reactions of actual buyers. We're not just act, uh, trying to observe behaviors of sellers mm -hmm. um, and not understand why it works. And the other thing is never survey a buyer, always simulate a selling situation or run a controlled field experiment like we do. Because again, customers and surveys will answer the way they think they want to be seen. Yep. And uh, it's like when I was asked by my financial advisor to fill in a survey about how risky I am, I'm super risky in the survey. <laughs> now when the market goes down, I'm like, get me out. And and so what we realize is surveys are bunk. So any, any training that's based on surveying a customer on what they think they do, bunk. Anything that's based on unexamined folklore of an individual, bunk. This, the data of simulations and studies of how humans actually make decisions is the only way to feel confident that what you're doing will have the impact you desire. Got it. I love it, Tim. I really appreciate that. And I know Sales Nation do as well. With that, tell us where we can find the expansion sale and where we can find out a little bit more about yourself. So you can find the expansion sale on Amazon. 
Uh, we are pleased to say in the first three weeks of its release, it was the number one new release on Amazon for business marketing, business sales, and customer relations. So this is important regardless of role. If you are a commercial person having customer conversations, existing customer conversations, this works. So go to Amazon for the expansion sale. Uh, if you want to find me and our company, we're at Corporate Visions. It's corporate and visions, all one word, plural, corporatevisions.com. We have tons of resources, free eBooks, reports, webcasts. We believe in the abundance mentality. We want to tell you what we know, and maybe someday you'll need our help, but we're here to let you know how to do it, how to do it right, and do that as a science-backed, proven approach. Good stuff. Well, I'll link to the book, everything else that we talked about, uh, the website and everything else that we've just discussed, and maybe even some of the, I'll link to some of the webinars or the, the anything that talks about the studies as well for any nerds like myself that want to dive into it in a little bit more detail in the show notes over at salesman.org. And with that, Tim, I want to thank you for your time, your expertise and all this, and for joining us on the show. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. 